Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Ourobora. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're interviewing Naya from Full Glass Wine. Thanks for coming on the pod. For people who don't know, what does the company do? We sell direct-to-consumer wine. We are a brand acquisition and management firm. We've been around for not too long, uh, just about 13 months, but mm -hmm. we're growing through acquisition. So how many acquisitions have you made so far? Four. Okay. And then what brought you into this business? What do you see in the wine world that every listener is like, I don't get it, I don't see it. What's the opportunity? Uh, obviously, COVID, everyone started drinking more. Today, maybe that's weaned off. We're being told millennials aren't drinking anymore. What, what do you see in the marketplace as it relates to wine? I mean, that was a great number of questions there, right? So I'll kind of go through some of these things, kind of one thing at a time here. But we truly are business opportunists, right? And it's looking at the market and seeing what's going on at any given point in time and where is their opportunity. A lot of different people across the board have been looking at things like we're doing, just we're doing in the direct-to-consumer wine space. And so if you notice in November, December of last year in 2022, Three, you saw a lot of companies were going around and acquiring various components of the um, CPG beauty companies, let's say, for example, right? Because there was a, a lot of money that was raised in 2020, 2021. Interest rates were low, so you had free-flowing cash everywhere. Those were the days. I know. <laughs> they really were the days, right? And Everybody could be an rates. idiot. You could be fine. It was amazing. But see, that's the thing, that's right? The thing. So you had all these companies that were there, and these companies were good. Right, so each company has something great. Some, so one of them would have great customer service, one had great strong brand affinity, one had a really good brand. You have all these different companies out there. Mm -hmm. And for us, we're specifically focused in on direct-to-consumer wine, but you're seeing that across CPG across the board. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different consolidations that have been coming up. And so for us, it was, you know, me and my co-founder got together and we essentially said, listen, we have a background in direct-to-consumer wine. My co-founder was the founder of Goose Island, the beer. And then he also founded a company called Beverage Solutions, which he sold, which later got rebranded as the Wall Street Journal Wine Club. And so I had worked with him before at a previous company in wine. And so there's so much that's involved in the direct-to-consumer component with shipping and logistics and everything else. And so we said, we see all these companies that are there. They're all good, but they need a little bit of love. Okay. And let's put them together under one roof and then let's scale them. Okay. So that's the first part. And the other thing that you asked about also was, you know, younger generations and looking at alternative types of products. Here's an example. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I kind of look at it like coffee. Okay. Right. So Coffee was a big thing back in the day, and it still is. Still a big thing. <laughs> Go yeah. Starbucks, right? Yeah. But there are alternative forms of energy drinks and et cetera that you can get, but people still like coffee. Coffee is getting people together. You're going to go have a drink together. You have fun with it. That's what wine is, right? So could you get something else, an alternative? Absolutely. But there's something nice about getting everyone together for a glass of wine or cheersing and celebrating, and you can't replace that with gummies, yeah. right? When you were doing these acquisitions, what's the thing that you look for the most? And so do you consider yourself like really good at logistics? Is it something around just a consumer that you can market to in a different way that maybe the company you're acquiring doesn't really understand or that you guys, like what's the secret sauce to sort of your implementation of consolidating these companies? If I gave you my secret sauce, yeah. it wouldn't be a secret, <laughs> right? You know, truthfully, it's looking at the market and saying, okay, what are the skill sets that we currently have? What are the companies that are out there? Which are the ones that are available? And even if they aren't, we can go and have a conversation with them. But if we view ourselves as a strategic and the direct to consumer wine space, it's what are the components that we're missing, right? And so there's another acquisition that confidentially we're working on right now. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and it is a different type of a, a selling mechanism, essentially, which is unique. And a lot of people have tried to be successful at it, but haven't made it yet. And so for us, that's something that we don't currently have. And you know, knock on wood, it'll yeah, close in a minute. It. Yeah, good for you. Thank you, thank you. And then we'll have the founder and then the rest of the, the a good the majority team. of the team as well. Yeah, okay, give people a window into when they sign up, what are they doing, what are they buying, how are they shipping, the whole thing. Gotcha, and it depends on which brand we, right, we're exactly. working under, right? So, yeah. It's like um, we got a shipment here from Wink. Yes. Okay, so give people a window into the Wink sort of customer segment, the process, who's the customer there, what is that like? Absolutely, so Wink is a really fun brand and a lot of people are familiar with Wink. It had a lot of media attention, a lot of press and excitement back in the day. And Wink really is a fun, Instagrammable type of a company and the product really is focused towards millennial women. 
And so very fun, very nice to look at. The bottles have a, a fun kind of a play on them as well. And so Wink is a subscription company. So that's kind of the difference that we have with some of our brands are subscriptions, some of our transactional. Transactional are when people buy at one time. Now the difference that it makes for us on the back end from a shipping standpoint is gonna be we can plan for the shipments versus their real-time shipments, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, one thing that we do really great also is that we have three different warehouses. So even as soon as we acquire one of these companies, within 30 days of the acquisition, we end up moving them to our warehouses. Okay. Now, which direct All over the country, wine, or are they? There are three in different parts of the country. Okay, smart. Yeah, yes, and sense. the reason for that is everybody's so used to Amazon shipments. Right. You place an order this morning, and you're like, all right, I'm going to get it later today, right? Yeah, that's Let right. Let alone tomorrow. That's right. So 33% of our shipments, about one-third of our shipments, get delivered within one day. And then um, another 33%. That's incredible. It is. Because it's heavy. It's heavy it stuff. It's glass. See, yes. That's an incredible thing. Amazon is shipping. Uh, there's obviously a package here. It's a little bag. There's probably something inside of it that weighs, you know, less than well, maybe a couple ounces. But, yeah. but glass, that's crazy. It is. And okay. so then another third of ours gets there delivered within two days. And then the final third is within three days, three business days. And wow. it depends on where in the country it's located. But for us, having a phenomenal 3PL and having three locations makes a really big difference because the product is so heavy and you're dealing with alcohol also, yeah. you have zone skipping costs. So a lot of people think we need to take the product and consolidate it into one warehouse because that's very efficient. That's efficient to an extent when you're a certain size, but once you expand past that size itself, the issue ends up being is that it's too expensive to be shipping the product all over the place. That's right. Yeah, and you guys have solved for that. Yes. To the consumer listening or to the person who's in wine, what are you seeing at like a macro scale in the wine business as a whole across America? Are there new geographies coming onto wine? You know, I think some people may think wine could be somewhat uppity. I don't. I'm a big fan. But obviously, we live in California. So going to places like Santa Barbara or Napa offer us opportunities to get educated. What are you seeing at scale as to who the wine consumer is or maybe who it's becoming? I think that, I mean, it's a really interesting kind of a question, right? Because I think wine typically had, I don't think, we know, right? Yeah, you wine, know. Yeah, wine typically had a uppity, stodgy type of a look and feel, right? And Younger customers now, and it's not just about age, right? But it's who we feel. I feel young. I know you do too, right? But we, um, <laughs> we're looking. <laughs> That's true. Touche, <laughs> yeah. right? We're looking for something that is more relevant with the culture, with the day, with the age, and constantly thinking about a bit of that stodginess of the old world is, is quite a bit dated. Now, there is still a good large market of people that are going to be buying wine for those reasons, and it's a hobby and a passion for them to enjoy the craft of making the wine and doing all that. And, and we have that as well, but it's still about making sure that the product is a little bit more relevant. And it's not just the product itself, but it's what the product stands for. And that's something that we're very excited for at Full Glass Wine, because when we're taking on these portfolio of brands, they, they already are great. Mm -hmm. What can we do to give it a little bit of an uplift to get them to where things are today in the world? And what, what do you think that uplift is specifically from your perspective? So we have a couple of great things that we're working on, which will be coming out in the next few months. And some of that has to do with technology and some things that we've been looking at in regards to how you can update your preferences and everything else utilizing AI, which we're very, very excited about. And then some of it also is from the branding standpoint of how the current trends are reflected in the products that we currently have and just really showcasing you know, the pulse take on what's happening in the, the world. And we do have some really great things. And I'm very excited for your listeners to continue to, to follow in. us. Yes, yeah. at Full Glass Wine. The AI stuff. When AI first came out, where did your mind go in terms of what's possible? And I know it's still early days, but in terms of wine preferences, maybe introducing new people to different brands that they might not know about, that feels sort of lightweight. How do you think about the future of AI specifically for wine? No, or your consumer even? Well, AI has been out forever, probably before you and I were even born, okay. right? And so it's just become more readily usable, I guess you can say, to the masses in the past couple of years, but it's been there for such a long time. One of the companies that we acquired before, too, two of them actually had it, but one had a phenomenal algorithm. 
And so taking that algorithm, there's a lot of uh, a cumbersome burden that you essentially have on a system on matching all the preferences that a consumer has. Mm -hmm. And this is the hard part with the wine, okay. right? With the three warehouses yeah. is tying it to inventory management. Mm -hmm. Now using AI, you can do a lot of these things, but much, much quicker. And then also manage it alongside with the inventory balancing that we have to do with three warehouses. Because if there's a certain type of product that you really like, but it's sitting in our New York warehouse, but you're sitting in California, that kind of skips the whole purpose of us having it set up so that we have three different warehouses and it's more shipper to, chip, to ship it over. Sure. There's somebody who might come on the podcast in the future, uh, Dress Drury. I don't know if you know who she is, but she has a wine company. And when we got the wine, it comes with like bracelets and like, yeah. and like a Sharpie. And yeah. it's kind of trying to have you have your girls night with like fun bracelets. And then you write down things that happen that night. You put it on the bottle. Maybe you save the yeah. bottle. Experiential. It felt like that. And it was interesting to me. I was like, oh, I don't know if this hits with today's consumer, but I like that someone is taking an approach of thinking of a new way to enjoy yeah. wine that feels more like slumber party vibes. But, you know, maybe that's in interesting. Yeah. Do you see any innovation happening on that side of it? Or are you guys like, yeah, what do you see in that space? I think, um, you know, I think it depends, right? And so are we going to do something like that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I mean, it's almost like a fab fit fun approach that you could look at. But for wine, it gets a little bit more challenging just because we are dealing with different warehouses. That makes it a little bit harder from the pick pack standpoint. And then in addition to that, you know, some people, they'll try chocolate and wine and different things. But now you're dealing with temperature controls and everything else across the board. And so it just makes it harder. I think that if the business is small, it's a little bit easier to try some of these different things where we're a new company, but we're not that small. But are we open to innovation at any given point in time? I mean, even Disney right now is trying to do a whole big grand uplift because you have to constantly be innovating. I think that's the fun part about marketing, though, right? It's yeah. just the world keeps changing and you get to kind of move to yeah. the question just is that's hard is can you get ahead of those movements that's right can you be first like yeah. gary v with yeah. his wine company yeah <laughs> yeah how do you guys view that how do you guys view digital marketing in your space obviously you have a lot of different brands and so in some way you could operate as like a venture studio or you know you have a really good marketing team Yes. Just, how do you do that? So for us, again, we haven't been around too, too long. And so, cause we're doing all these through acquisitions, but what I really like about what we do, and it's taken us a minute to kind of get our footing straight there is a lot of companies do shared operations and finance. Everyone hears about that. We're doing shared marketing services. Okay. So Smart. each one of our brands has its own brand director. And as those brands grow, maybe the team will grow as well. And the brand director really owns the the vibe, the customer voice, they understand, live and breathe that consumer segment. Got it. Now, the shared marketing services is with direct to consumer, the fun part is it's all analytics. It's okay. all analytics and it's all data. Okay. And essentially also, let's say we're doing SMS texting and you wanna to move to a new texting platform or a new service you're using. Our shared marketing services takes care of that. That creates a lot of efficiencies, which is a phenomenal thing to have. Yeah. And then they'll work and coordinate everything with the brand directors. Again, where the brand directors are really, you know, the colors, the look and feel, the voice, the vibe, all sure. of those things. That's really smart. And Thank so you keep you. that in house. Yeah. So that's the part of the team that you'll acquire. Essentially, those are the ones that you keep. Yes. Unless there's any other information or specific knowledge to that company. Absolutely. How many more acquisitions do you want to make? Like how, how big, when you think about two years, three years, five years from now, where is the company? How many acquisitions have been made? So we are, and this is information that we have as public as well. So, you know, we're currently set to do right now just about a hundred million dollars in revenue. And that's not counting this, this new, new acquisition that you're the first person I've really told to, <laughs> right? Dropping soon. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, within the next, let, let's see, pretty let's see. pretty soon, It might right? be a good weekend for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fingers crossed, right? <laughs> and so um, uh, should that should that all close, we'll probably be at a run rate of 125 to 150 for this year. And so we don't have any mandate on us that essentially says we have to do X number of acquisitions. It truly is looking at these things from a market opportunity standpoint. So yeah. if the right type of opportunities are available, of course, we're going to take a look at it and evaluate it. We've had a lot of people ask us, you know, over the past year, um, are you sure you're going to be able to do this and make it happen? And you know what we say? We don't know. Yeah, you don't know. We just don't know. But every, Delusional optimism. Every, <laughs> I, uh, I teach undergrad and um, my students, I teach entrepreneurial accounting and finance. My students ask me all the time, they're like, how do you know these things are going to happen? And I literally, it's delusional optimism, right? And you, you just find a way to figure it out 
It's like the burn the ships. Yeah, burn the boats. Burn the boats, right? Matt Higgins. And it, you Have just, you read that book? I haven't, but it was a, originally, I think it was a Napoleon, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah. who had originally, yeah, and yeah, then he made the, the book after that. Yeah. But he's great as well, Matt, right? And so, but it's it's a mindset. And that mindset, I really think, is such a, an exciting part of entrepreneurship, but you figure it out, and you figure it out with the right people and everyone else, and it, and it is a lot of fun. And so what is our plan? Just back to your original question for the next couple of years, we want to continue to grow. We want to get this company to two two fifty million in revenue within the next year and a half, two years. And so oh, wow. how are we okay. going to do it? Yeah. Let's see what happens. Do you guys want to go public? We don't know yet about that. Yeah. We don't know yet. You'd be in prime position. It'd be interesting. You might have, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Let's go deep into something real quick. So I was, that oddly deep? enough, I was talking to Matt recently. <laughs> gotcha. And we were talking about this thing where it's like, when the entrepreneur is about to launch into something so crazy, it induces every feeling. So the fear, the anxiety, if your parents have put in money, there's that. If your friends have put in money, you know, you really want to make it successful because it's it could be a, what feels like a very public failure. And so he always talks about the, the notion of using the anxiety and moving it towards your goals. And so the idea being you're going to get anxious, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But how do you move it so it's healthy and not like a debilitating process? When you guys were first embarking on this, yeah. you know, how did you view it? Like some people cure anxiety by just doing work, right? And so, which I think is healthy. <laughs> like just go into the work, do the emails, set up the meetings. Do you have like a tactic you guys use for whenever you're going through these stressful moments? I do, because it happens a lot, yeah, right? Yeah, so. this is going to be good. Besides having an amazing stylist <laughs> who takes <laughs> that my off husband? the table. Who's my husband? <laughs> yeah. It's going to probably sound a little bit simpler sure. than probably anybody would imagine what I'm about to say right now. But so a couple of years ago, I started to get a, a few gray hair. Do you have any gray hair? Probably. 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 Right? I want so I more. Gotta... I want more. I think it helped me. You... <laughs> I think like a little salt and pepper goes a long yeah, way in, gotcha. in, in the boardroom or like, gotcha. you know what I mean? Raising capital, <laughs> Maybe. Silver, a silver fox raising capital seems easy. <laughs> Got it. That's at least in my head. That's the delusion. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> A few years ago, I started to get some gray hair. I think if I got gray, and there's nothing wrong with gray hair, right? It's just, what it was interesting for me was, is I started to get it as I got older, right? So my younger sister got gray hair when she was younger. And that doesn't mean you're getting older. I got it at a certain age, right? Which I won't talk about here, but yeah, I got it at a certain it. age, right? <laughs> and I, you know what I realized? We think we have all the time in the world, but we don't. And time is coming. It's not about the gray hair, but it's about the fact that the amount of time that we have to do the things in the world that we want is finite. Mm -hmm. I used to get so worried and apprehensive about putting myself out there. And because I teach, I do all these things, I have a great community of people, and I didn't want to look bad. And I didn't want to mess up, and I was scared of failure. And then when I started to get the gray hair, I realized I've just been waiting for everything to be perfect, for all the stars to align before I put myself out there. And then I realized that time might never happen. I'm just getting older. And again, nothing wrong with getting older, but it was a realization for me. So last summer, I said to myself, I'm going to go all out till the end of May, the May of, tw of 2024. And all this was out. last summer, okay. all out. And, and I talked to my husband about it, my stylist. I talked to my in-laws. I talked to my parents. And I told everyone, my plan here is I'm going to go all out. Every opportunity that comes my way, I'm just going to jump. If it's something for press, if it's something for work, if it's something for family, I'm just going to go all out. And everyone has their own definition of all out was. My definition was I'm not going to be worried about what's going to happen if it doesn't work out. And I just kept jumping. And for me, having it set with a date that I'm going to do it until this date, yeah. you know, and it was, it was a seven, eight month period, right? Yeah. So I said, for the next seven to eight months, I'm just going to go all out and I'm not going to be worried about how I look. Yeah. I didn't like posting on Instagram before. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to quit that post. Yeah. I wasn't as, you know, I didn't want to talk about things that I was working on because I didn't want it to be that, what if it doesn't work out? People are going to know I failed. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put it out there and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And now, 13 months later, we've acquired four companies, hopefully closing on the fifth, and we have a full-fledged company here. It's like magic. It but feels we, like magic. It, yes, yeah. it feels like magic. But we, us questioning ourselves. This is of no value. It, it isn't. Yeah, 
That's totally true. And it's almost how do you kind of shift it? It wasn't that I said I'm going to shift it to the side forever. Mentally, by telling myself I'm going to shift that concern, fear, anxiety, self-doubt, I think self-doubt was the biggest one, I'm going to shift it to the side for a period of time. So later I can have it back. After May, I can self-doubt, do whatever I want, <laughs> yeah. I can take it back. Yeah. The interesting thing is it started to turn into a muscle. Yeah, interesting. And it's just now, it's what month are we in? August. It's yeah. August now, right? Yeah. So it was this May of this year I said I was going to go all out till. And now you can turn it on or off as you wish. It's nice. Yeah. I actually love it. I mean, that's a good answer. Everyone deals with it a little bit differently. And, and life has a role in it, too. You know, like for me, like I lost my father when I was young. And so when that happened, it's like you realize how time is everything. And so I've yeah. always just solved for time, which is interesting. That is Never really, for money, always for yeah. time. And in that you have to solve for money because if you want your time, it means you can't have a normal job unless you choose to. And then you make that decision on your own. But if you want all the flexibility in the world, it means like you have to do weird things like become an entrepreneur or like do real estate development. Creative, create, creative you gotta things. You got to create these things that, <laughs> yeah. that are not taught and you know, you have to just take risks. Yeah. Um, but it's a different approach. I love that, by the way, how you're solving for time. And it's interesting because so we closed our Series A in March of this year. And to close for a direct-to-consumer wine company doing a consolidation. Yeah, was very, really interesting time also, by the way. Very, very hard. But what's interesting today is it's not that capital is easy to come by, but it's easier for us to come by than it was five to six months ago. Because once you can prove that you can execute and you can make things happen, it's interesting how much capital starts to come your way. Yeah, that's right? all it is, yeah. So to get us to March, which is when we, again, we closed our Series A, was very, very hard. It was very difficult. Yeah. And then now since then, we're doing acquisition after acquisition because people look at us and they say, you know what, you actually follow through with what you said you're going to do and we want to support entrepreneurs and founders who actually work that way. Yeah, that's the beauty of this time. Yeah. Where if you've been able to sort of withstand the COVID and the high inflationary period and you have a good business model, you're really one of few horses to bet on. And there's a lot of capital ready mm -hmm. to chase horses right now. That's exactly right. So it is a really fun market. Well, let's wrap. Where can people find you? Where can people find the brand? This is so well, good. Thank you. Fullglasswine.com is our website. And then obviously right now I have my Instagram account, which is Neha T. Kumar. But we're building and growing and can't wait to continue to get this company to a very, very fun place. New acquisition coming soon. Possibly, yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. <laughs> of course. It was great talking to you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.